why refractive surgeons choose Presbyon for their own presbyopic eyes. I've been the lead consultant for Carl Zeiss uh, Meditech and Refractive Lasers uh, for almost 20 years now. And uh, I acknowledge a financial interest in the uh, Artemis Insight 100 from ArcScan, which uh, as you know, is very helpful for epithelial mapping and um, ICL sizing, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So we know that the treatment options for presbyopia essentially uh, currently allow us only to replace the loss of the dynamic process of accommodation with a static solution. And the two static options available traditionally have been multifocality and monovision. What I'm gonna talk about today is a third option, which is extended depth of field or EDOF, what we call laser blended vision in the cornea. And the Presbyon product at Carl Zeiss was something that I developed uh, about 15 years ago and was commercialized by Zeiss about 10 years ago. I don't have a financial interest in Presbyon. So what we need to understand about the differences between um, brain adaptation in multifocality, we are depending on the brain distinguishing two or more images inside one eye. So it's a form of intraocular rivalry that has to be resolved in the brain. Whereas in monovision, we're dealing with a binocular rivalry. In other words, um, one eye has one image and the other eye has another image and the brain has to choose between one or the other image. A successful contact lens monovision patient does not perceive half a field of vision when they're looking at distance. They perceive a whole field of vision. So there is a neural adaptation that occurs in the mind that allows the patient in to, to, to see uh, the full visual field despite the fact that one eye is working more than the other. Now, what is Presbyon? Well, it's based on the principle of using spherical aberration, which is a naturally occurring aberration of the eye, to increase the depth of field of the eye. And when I say it's a natural aberration, what I mean is that it occurs and increases as we age. And also, of course, during accommodation, the lens becomes more rounded, and so it has more spherical aberration. So it is not a multifocal. There is not a situation where there's two foci in one eye, but rather a spread of the focus, a depth of field. Now, how does that work? Well, we know that to get a perfect focus, we need an aspheric lens. But if you have a spherical lens, we know that the periphery of the lens focuses like closer. And so the, the, the focus is actually dispersed. It's spread over an over, a, over a, a volume, uh, an area. If we represent this um, as how it creates blurring on a chart, on the top row here, we have the defocus that is produced by increasing amounts of myopic defocus. And we, we concentrate on the minus 150 diopter defocus. We can see that there's a lot of blur. In fact, people are normally about 2080 or 21, 2100. Um, with a minus 150, just if they walk in off the street. But what you can see here is that with the same amount of defocus, if we add spherical aberration, the edge detection of these letters suddenly increases. And so this is a, almost um, a, a way of proving how spherical aberration works in the brain of the human mind. Because I'm showing you, all of you are looking at this slide, and the image below here does have minus 150 defocus, but when you add the spherical aberration, that edge, that spherically aberrated edge is processed by your brain. And that's why you can see more edge on this image. Now, in Presbyond, we are not actually um, inducing spherical aberration in the distance and non-dominant eye like this. These are not the images that the brain needs to put together because there's neural processing. And so in fact, 
the vision in the mind of this spherical aberrated uh, chart on the retina is actually a lot better. And the spherical aberration on the retina of the dominant eye set for distance is also much better. So in fact, in Presbyon, the brain is only having to put together two images that are actually not that different. And so, and we know that most people can tolerate a little bit of a disparity between images in eyes and still fuse. So this is, these two images are essentially diagrammatically what we are trying to get the brain to adapt to in Presbyon. And that's quite different from these two images, which are the images that a monovision patient would have to adapt to. And that's why when we do Presbyon, when we have a patient coming in, we don't do a contact lens monovision trial because that will exclude all of the patients who would have tolerated Presbyon. And so it's actually contraindicated in a sense to do a contact lens monovision trial. Of course, if someone already wears contact lens monovision, then fantastic because it's a great preparation uh, for, um, for Presbyon. So let's concentrate on this non-dominant eye and the fact that we have a minus 150 defocus and that the spherical aberration makes the edge detection better on the retina. But let's not forget that there is always meiosis, no matter how old the patient is, even a 70 year old has meiosis. And so the meiosis increases the depth of field when the effort is made to look up close and combining these two effects gives a retinal image that is fairly uh, you know, in focus with a large depth of field and then the brain produces further edge, edge improvement uh, by filtering the spherical aberration in the way that the brain is designed to do. So the point here is that we're able to do a presbyopic, a static presbyopic treatment, but it doesn't depend on diffractive optics or bifocal or trifocal optics. And we know that in corneal surgery, there's been fairly mixed success so if we look at the Vizix um, multifocal uh, hyperopic presbyopic attempt, they had 6.5% uh, of the eyes losing two lines with the Bausch and Lomb super core, 4% of the eyes lose two lines. And with the, uh, the, um, the Presby Max from Schwind, uh, originally they had about 12% loss of two lines. They reduced the ad, got it down to 5%. Uh, and then reduced the ad even further in the dominant eye and got the loss of lines down to 0%, but that's, it, that's for binocular vision. So still multifocality, you know, because it causes you know, a lot of aberrations and, and, and very high order um, spherical aberrations, and because of the central island effect that might not be 100% perfectly centered, multifocality in the cornea is difficult. Now, of course, monovision we know has challenges of its own. About 50, 60 percent of people tolerate monovision, and the, you know, there are various reasons why monovision is not a great idea. And we're talking about surgeons choosing surgery for their own eyes. Full monovision can lead to loss of stereoacuity, and that's something that's not desirable for eye surgeons. But you see, Presbyond modifies the binocular vision of the eye and improves on all of these disadvantages of monovision. So you see the near vision of the distance eye is much better with Presbyon because of the depth of field. And the distance vision of the near eye is much better. And so because the images are much less di disparate, so the 97% of people are able to tolerate this difference between the eyes, as opposed to about 50 to 60% of people with monovision. So, about 95% of the, or more than 95% of the people that walk through the door in the clinic pass the tests for being candidates for Presbyon. And we have statistics on the adaptation rates and for Plano Presbyopes, 97% of patients are adapted by one year. We measured stereoacuity uh, in a group of hyperopes, emetropes, and uh, myopes uh, having had Presbyon, and we found that quite surprisingly, that the uncorrected stereoacuity was 
400 seconds in every patient, and in three quarters of the patients, it was 100 seconds or better, which means, think about it, threading a needle requires 800 seconds of stereo. So we maintain the binocularity, even though the eyes are a little bit different because of the depth of field. So why is there binocularity? Well, it's to do with the visual acuity potential across the retina. And if we consider that the peripheral retina is 2200, and the central retina is 2020, we know that at five degrees eccentric from the fovea, the vision drops already to 2060. So in the case of monovision, we have essentially one eye that's 2200 and the other eye that has you know, normal vision. So the retinal disparity within the foveal region, the macular region is very high. And that requires neural suppression in order to tolerate this. Whereas in presbyond, the central vision of the non-dominant eye is about 2060. And what this means is that when the eyes are both open, the parafoveal area is, has the same acuity in both eyes. And there's much more retinal correspondence within the macula of each eye. And that's why we think that there is fusion and an acceptance of the brain of the two different images. And obviously the fusion that's required when the images are, are similar. And that's why we get neural summation. So looked at in two dimensions, the peripheral vision is 2200, the central vision is 2020. Traditional monovision requires suppression because of the great, uh, the lack of overlap, if you like, within the macular region. Whereas because of the central vision, of the non-dominant eyes in, in presbyond, there's far more overlap and therefore we recruit summation and retain all the advantages of stereoacuity and binocularity with presbyond. And we can see this here because here's 395 eyes, myopia up to minus eight, hyperopia up to plus six, and 100, almost 150 emetropic patients. And you can see that the average you know, eye of the non-dominant eye is 2060 at distance. And that's 80% of the eyes are 2060 at distance. We'd expect those eyes to be 2080 or 2100 actually. But you see the distance vision of the dominant eyes, 92% are 2020. And when they combine the two binocularly, the distance vision goes up to 96% 2020. So the addition of the other eye gives summation, which is not something that we see in monovision. So this is different from monovision. And of course, a number of labs have now demonstrated the principles which we described originally in 2004, later on using adaptive optic systems, where, where in this study, for example, by Carolina Rocha, she used an adaptive optic system to show that as you increase the spherical aberration, so you increase the depth of field. And it didn't matter if we increase the spherical aberration in a positive direction or in a negative direction. What we capitalized on really was the understanding of the therapeutic range of spherical aberration, the range in which you can get an increase of depth of field without the toxic effects of excess spherical aberration, which we all know cause night vision disturbances and halos and starbursts. So having this one and a half diopter depth of field limit because of the therapeutic range and not wanting to lose contrast, then we have to recruit a little bit of anisometropia in order to get continuous vision from distance to intermediate to near. And you know, mathematically, this works out approximately that the distance eye is set to plano, but at near, it sees as if it was minus 0.75. So it has about intermediate vision. And the non-dominant eye is set at minus 150, but with that 150 depth of field, the distance vision is as if it was minus 0.75, and the near vision is as if it was minus 225. So you see why we have this huge range and why we have this continuous vision from near through intermediate and through to distance rather than what we have with multifocality, which is discrete distances uh, that are provided by these uh, multifocal corneas or multifocal um, intraocular lenses. I think many of you have already seen our publications for myopia, hyperopia, and emetropia. You can see that the outcomes are superb, and that's because we are taking advantage of the accuracy of LASIK. 
LASIK is a very accurate procedure. And so because Presbyond is LASIK, it's the same accuracy and it controls cylinder with the same accuracy. So we have, you know, virtually all of our patients are spectacle independent virtually all the time. Essentially, when we take all these statistics together, we have, you know, almost 100% seeing 2020 J5 for myopia, uh, 95% up to plus six for hyperopia and the emetropes, 97% are seeing 2020 and J5 newsprint. So strictly speaking, we have uh, the most accurate and the best outcomes of all procedures because you know IOL calculations, for example, aren't as accurate as lasers, we know that. And here we're demonstrating how the intermediate vision uh, is achieved for virtually all patients. This is my uh, 240 patients, myopia up to minus 12. So almost 100% see computer font size 12. And the same with hyperopia, almost 100% seeing computer distance uh, font size 12. In terms of safety, of course, we already defined that we don't want to increase the spherical aberration in the toxic range, which is why we don't lose two lines of best spectacle corrected vision. That's the design of the, of, of the profile. And not only we don't lose lines, we actually don't lose contrast. And in fact, statistically, we slightly see a slight increase in contrast, probably because we're optimizing the, contra the spherical aberration um, in these older eyes. So it's not just our outcomes from the London Vision Clinic, but now we have, um, you know, papers coming out of Europe, um, out of, you know, these are the European reports out of, out of um, this, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and now uh, the Asian component, where it, both in China and in Korea, where people are publishing their outcomes of laser blended vision uh, Presbyon um, and achieving the same great results that we've been enjoying at the London Vision Clinic since 2004. Needless to say, we're avoiding the rare but potential complications of intraocular surgery. Um, and, you know, not to mention the um, rather high um, YAG rates um, that are usually produced by these multifocal IOLs um, and the fact that they can't be put into the sulcus. So, you know, the, um, if there's any capsular problem, then that, that, that kind of eliminates the option there. And, you know, I, I just want to reiterate that we've been starting to, we started teaching uh, Presbyond about five years ago, four years ago now, and something happened uh, during that. And that's how I want to finish my, my talk. Um, because this online course, which we deliver twice a year live in London, but now we're doing it on demand, of course, and, and recorded because of our travel restrictions. But we're hoping next June to start live again. But you see, the first time I taught the course, I had a surgeon who came up to me and said, um, you've convinced me, I, 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 I do a lot of refractive lens exchange, but um, this looks like what is right for me. Would you do my eyes? And I said, wow, that's very... Um, uh, that's quite an honor. Um, why don't we schedule your surgery for the next course? And you can come a few days before we do your surgery, and then you can give a talk at the course on your process, your mental process that you went through to come from the procedure that you do for patients and over to this procedure for your own eyes. And he did this. And at that next lecture, we had another surgeon who uh, actually was a very, very, very avid clear lens exchange surgeon in the UK, very well known um, and, and a great surgeon, I have to add. Um, and, you know, he came up and asked for the same thing. So we started a, a daisy chain and essentially we've now operated on almost 20 surgeons, I think, just as a result of the course uh, generating the confidence in this option uh, for being spectacle independent as an ophthalmologist requiring high stereo acuity, high visual acuity, no loss of contrast, and all of these benefits that Presbyond offers. Uh, we know now that Professor Zhou uh, operated on one of your colleagues in China. And so, you know, this hopefully is now starting to uh, become a thing uh, in, in China. And I, I am so excited about this because Obviously the aging population in China is huge um, and refractive lens exchange in high myopic eyes, perhaps not, you know, the, not the, the least anxiety uh, uh, provoking procedure for the surgeon and let alone the patient. And so offering an extraocular procedure that can be done on the cornea is, is, is really wonderful in China, I think. Um, we know that 
Zeiss has now started to post videos of all the surgeons and their stories of how they came to deciding to have Presbyond on their own eyes. Um, and, you know, it's quite understandable, I think, why surgeons opt for this. Uh, it's basically benefits from the safety of LASIK. It can correct emetropic presbyopia. It can cr correct a wide range of refractive errors, including cylinder. And of course, it's based on a natural aberration called spherical aberration. So if things change down the road as they could because they, the lens shifts or something, that's not a problem because it's very easily enhanced on the cornea again, over and over again with time. The surgery, of course, is centered on the visual axis with an eye tracker, so there's no centration issues. And we know that there's no change in contrast sensitivity, and so there's very little change to night vision. 5% of patients um, will prefer to have spectacles for driving at night because of the difference between the eyes, but it's tolerated by 95%, at least 95% of the patients that walk through the door. And we maintain functional stereoacuity, again, very important for surgeons. And remember, LASIK is a bilateral 10 minute procedure in both eyes that heals overnight. So uh, the word of mouth with this procedure is exceedingly um, uh, fast. So this is really the least invasive procedure with the least side effects and the highest accuracy. And I think this contributes to the reason why refractive surgeons choose Presbyon for their own eyes. Thank you very much.